Many people tell me that I'm crazy. They're all right. All of them. Five years ago, I was living in southern Alberta with my beautiful wife, oblivious to the world around me, living like everybody else, in the suburbs, hiding in my house, chasing after the things I was told I was supposed to chase after, making priorities of things I was told to make priorities of, and absolutely hating my life. And through a long series of somewhat unfortunate events. Nine of us, between the ages of two and 92, threw all of our belongings into a 40-foot container, bought a forgotten farm in the valley, up on a hill, overlooking the bay, and decided we were gonna go farm, sell meat directly to the public, without having any idea how to do that. Now, fortunately for us, our father, my father-in-law, the patriarch of who we are, uh, is a genius farmer, so we had a backbone in good ethical agricultural practices, but we had no idea how to sell meat, what the cuts even were, or how to make sure you were making any money doing it. And believe me, that's a hard job. So we bought this farm. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> that was the good house. So we got there and we weren't able to live in the houses. It was a big farm, it had an illustrious career. It goes back pre-Confederation. There's a legacy to this place, and we want to restore it. So we lived in this house, and there's going to be a picture of some tents. We occupied farm. <laughs> Way before Occupy was cool. Here's our living room and kitchen. There were nine of us, between the ages of two and 92, living like this for three months in one of the rainiest Julys on record, <laughs> trying to figure out how to get this farm running, how to do a farmer's market every Saturday, how to wake up at two o'clock in the morning and not want to roll over and go back to sleep, and build a business. But as we proceeded, we realized that we weren't building a business. And that was something very unique to Nova Scotia, something that we love about Nova Scotia and why we are now home, even though I will always be from away. But what we found in Nova Scotia is that as we tried to build a business, it wasn't about the business. What we ended up building was community. And that could not be more typified than this man right here. This is Granddad. We lost Granddad two years ago. But this picture is what community is all about. This man is a World War II veteran. Africa, fought under Montgomery, Dunkirk, D-Day, was there for Normandy. Fought his way up through Holland, went into, Br into Germany with the British troops, and fought for his country, and sacrificed a great deal for what he believed was his community. And when we moved to this farm, this man, he said, I'm going to help. Even though I'm blind as a bat and deaf as a post, he outworked me every single day at the age of 92. In this picture, he's cutting down weeds with a handsaw that he can't see, sidestepping snakes that he doesn't know are there. And he worked his back dry for us as a family. And it's his legacy that has taught us what it is to live in community and be in community and fight for something beyond ourselves. You see, I came out of Alberta where all I cared about was me and my ambitions and my goals and my dreams, the stuff, the reputation, the success. That's what we live like in Southern Alberta. That's what so many of us live like, even here. And we embrace everything that is about ourselves. But we forget that there's a great deal happening beyond us. There is a French historian, his name is Alexis de Tocqueville. And in the early 1800s, he wrote a book called Democracy in America, and he was observing America from a European perspective. You see, he was a, a, um, 
a nobleman. He had noble ancestry. And he was struck by the fact that in America, the only true place where democracy was not birthed out of an aristocratic rebellion, that there was this rampant individualism. Okay? And so he came to America and he studied this because he wanted to take these observations back to France and say, well, here's how America's doing it so well. And he said something that I had to write down because it's far too smart for me to remember. He described American individualism as a calm and considered feeling which dispossesses each citizen to isolate himself from the mass of his fellows and withdraw into the circle of family and friends. With this little society formed to his taste, he gladly leaves the greater society to look after itself. That is more true today than it has ever been. And that was 200 years ago. It is true here. It is true in the cities. It is true in the country. It is true all across North America. We have formed little societies to our tastes and then we do everything to reinforce that. Grandad did not. He knew what it meant to fight for his country, to sacrifice himself for his community. He had lost friends, men and women that he fought alongside, who gladly sacrificed themselves for something greater. There was a culture at that time that they all stood for something more than the little society that they had formed to their own taste. And that wasn't just Britain. Everybody all over made great sacrifices for their communities. And out of that, there came this movement in Britain called Great Farming, Great Britain. And my father-in-law talks about it all the time. And it's inadvertently become the ethos of what we're about. You see, the farmers there knew that during the war, Britain wasn't feeding itself. And they said to themselves, never again. We as farmers, humble farmers, have an obligation to our country to feed them. And if Great Britain is to be great, then farming must be great. And they worked hard, and they struggled, and they fought to be able to feed their country. And you know what Britain does today? Not that. They import their food from Africa. There is great exploitation in feeding the rich masses of the Western world. And great farming is gone. Now, the folks of granddad's generation, they saw these challenges. They recognized the needs because they were engaged with the community around them. They were not in little insular, isolated societies that they had formed for their own tastes, but they were engaged in their communities and they recognized needs even though they weren't their own. And that was a strength for them. But my challenge to us today is that we don't know. We want to talk about change, we want to talk about innovation, but we are hiding in our own little societies, formed to our tastes, not aware of what's really happening around us. And so as we have journeyed down this farming path, what I thought was about food, what I thought was about family, what I thought was about agriculture, has really all become about community. We don't sell meat. You get meat when you buy something, but what we want to sell is trust, is community. I have stood at the meat counter in our shop and wept with men who've lost their wives to cancer. I have stood with people and gloried over their newborn baby. I have rejoiced with men and women who have graduated, who have gotten promotions, who've moved on to great things in life and I'm a farmer at a little butcher shop in a farmer's market. When was the last time you cried with the guy at the meat counter in the grocery store? <laughs> I know, right? But that's what we're about. We're about community. And I got news for you. That's harder. It's hard to live in community. And not everybody here is going to have the unfortunate opportunity to fall into community with your in-laws like I did. But it was an opportunity. It has radically altered the course of my life, my wife's life, my family's life, and all the people who have become a part of it since. It's not just us anymore. We're not a family hiding in the corner, glorying in our success as a farm. Farming's hard. 
Butchery is hard. It's a struggle every day to make this thing work. But now there's more people who've become a part of our family, some of them here today. And they're family. We have staff that work with us that are part of our family. And we do everything we can for them because they are as valuable as us. The people that come into the shop to buy products, they're family. And we will bend over backwards to do everything we can for them because we're not about selling meat. We're about creating community. And they get meat in the process. And that's great because it's a good product. And we're proud of it for their sake so that they're healthy and they're safe. But we want to build community. We are about community. And through my situation and my context, I fell into it and it was forced on me, and it's come quickly. And that's not going to happen for everyone here, for everyone that watches this. That's not the way it's going to go. We need to be intentionally seeking out community for the sake of everyone around us. And that's going to be hard. It's going to require us to be wrong. It's going to require us to be vulnerable. It's going to require us to be uncomfortable because we've taken these societies and we've formed them to our tastes. And I got news for you. Real community is not about your tastes. But there's more satisfaction and joy in living with community, real true community, with crying and recreating and celebrating and rejoicing and arguing and disagreeing than there ever will be hiding in our little insulated circles, looking to ourselves and our own ideas. You see, we're facing a number of challenges in our society today. We could spend all day talking about them, but my proposal to you is, if we're going to really address them, if we are going to tackle the challenges of our world today, first, we need to fight for community. Because if all I see the world through is my insulated little bubble, I'm only going to recognize the challenges that affect my world. But if I'm friends with people who have different ideas, if I live with people who have different agendas, if I'm living life in rhythm with people I disagree with, I'm going to start to adopt ideas and recognize the importance of things that I never would have otherwise. And that is difficult. So I would encourage you with this. Eat together. Cook food with someone you've never cooked food with. Sit down and eat it. It's that simple. You would be surprised what community comes out of eating together. Go out together and buy the ingredients for your food. Gather the ingredients for your food. Hunt down food. Get together. Make a meal. Sit down and just eat together. Talk to all those people you see every day and have never talked to, and you know who I'm talking about. There are people whose paths we cross all the time. That's your community, and they're going to be different than you, and they're going to think you're weird. I'm weird. But they're not going to run in fear, not forever, But when they begin to realize that you are for something other than your little circle, when you are for something other than your little society, they're going to start to be for something. And my prayer is that you get to spend some time like this. This was granddad's 93rd birthday. We were still in tents. And we as a little community rejoiced in this man and his birthday and he is gone, and we miss him terribly. But his legacy is community. His legacy is that he worked and fought and sacrificed and lived and loved for those around him. So my challenge for you, fight for community first, because then we can change the world. Thank you.